Our next speaker, Yessi, is actually a, career, a YouTube creator who encourages people um, on their journey as developers. And in particular, uh, Yessi is going to talk to us today about automating ideas with Airflow. Efraim, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you for joining us. Thank so, you so much. Thanks. Yessi, welcome. Yeah. Bienvenida. Jesse, welcome. Now I'm going to switch to Spanish and our translator is going to switch to English. So Jesse, for those who do not know, but I think that everyone is knows you because your fan club is already here. Jesse is a doctor in artificial intelligence from the Universidad Veracruzana, and right now she is a data scientist and she has more than 13 years of experience in web development. So she shares knowledge in her YouTube channel and she's also on Twitter and Devs community. And she is going to talk to us today about automating ideas with Apache Airflow. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me, for allowing me to be here. And I would like to talk to you today about Apache Airflow and how my interest in this was born. It's really close to what Ephraim just told us. He told us about all his journey and I would like to tell you my journey and how I fell in love with this tool. So we are going to begin. Alma has already introduced me, but I will tell you about myself. Mm -hmm. My name is Jesseli Diaz. I am from Jalapa, Veracruz. I currently work as a data engineer, engineer and data lead at Reworth. And I also participate in devs community. You can find us in Slack as well. And before I begin, I would like to talk to you about what we're going to do in this presentation. First, I am going to talk, I am going to tell a very sad story. So I am going to tell you how Airflow started to arise some interest in me. And then I will talk about Apache Airflow, the key elements, sensors, operators, and the action plan. Now, first, I am going to talk to you about this very sad story, which where everything began. This story is about a friend, I'm going to call him John, and he, uh, Jesse, I'm sorry, can you please uh, put your presentation on full screen? Could you please help me confirm that you can see it? Just give me a second, because I was starting to have a bit of trouble here with PowerPoint. But I will display it in full screen now. Let's see. Can you see my full screen now? No. Okay, let me go back to share again. I think you can see it now. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. Okay, so I was telling you about my friend, John. He was working for a financial company focused on cryptocurrency. And here it all begins. I will tell you his story. This financial company's team, they have operations in Latin America. They work with a lot in this continent and its finance team is in Spain. So what happened there, it usually happens. We as developers can work with different teams in different countries. And the Spain team started working at 1 a.m. in Latin America, 1 a.m. in Mexico City time. And they began a series of queries and they updated the table with the latest results of the day prior. After that, John, 
was already sleeping, but he had to wake up every day at 6 a.m. to see what the finance team in Spain was doing to then run a query every day. All he had to change was one parameter, which is create at, and the result of that query, what he had to do was downloading the CSV. He ran another Python script from the console, from the bash, and he had to wait. And then the script was running, it was computing, among other things, and then he went back to sleep. He woke up again at 8 a.m. praying to God that the script had not failed because there was not a way to run it again at that time. He did not have that run control, so he came back at 8 a.m., he validated that the files were ready, and he generated a report. That report was an Excel file, which, which matched a couple of columns, and then he uploaded it to a bucket in S3, and then he sent an email to certain people, so that after that, at 9 a.m., John, well, he was already very angry, he hadn't rested, he had to run some script, and he had to arrive to his daily meeting at 9 a.m., and he had to do it every day from Monday to Friday. And I would like to begin with that story because I want you to keep that in mind to see why Apache Airflow was so important to me. So what is Apache Airflow? I would like to tell you a bit about how it came up. It was created by Maxime Beauchemont. And there is a small or a perfect union about beach, Mexico, a hammock, and vacation. And those four elements achieved airflow. And why am I telling you this? Well, Maxime, previously in his first stage, he was working with Facebook, and then he joined the team at Airbnb. And in that season, in that vacation seasons, because when developers go from one job to another, we finally have vacations and time to ourselves. Maxime decided to come to some beaches in Mexico and in his laptop, he started to create an idea. And I don't know if you thought about this, if he ever thought about this, about what became Apache Airflow. So his first commits were called Flux, not Airflow, and then he joined Airbnb. So there they adopted that project. For something I always loved is that Maxime always left it as open source. And for projects to have that potential that we look for in the community, they need to be open source so that more people such as Ephraim can join and can support the community and can support the coding. This solution is allowing to create a series of pipelines or of running tasks which is completely split, is completely adequate, completely simple to work with. And we are going to see a little bit more about Airflow because I love to know that Airflow is basically born in Mexico in a hammock with a laptop with great ideas from Maxim. So a bit of the history of Airflow, as I said, in 2014 was the first commit. It was called Flux. And then he, he joins Airflow and it begins to be the internal company system to make that series of pipelines. And in 2016, when the project started growing, it's joined to Apache Software Foundation incubator program so that more and more people can join the community and begin to share with us a lot more. They can begin to develop more modules, can make improvements, can support with different issues that they may have. And in 2018, it was integrated into the stack of Google Cloud. And if you are currently using Google Cloud Platform, it's integrated in Apache Airflow for you. And from 2019, it became a higher level project. So what is Airflow? What's it good for? 
Airflow allows us to generate a series of data, data pipelines, which is a series of different processes that we can develop. And I will tell you a bit about why I think Airflow is so important. When we are developing, uh, for example, if we are a data engineer or myself, I'm a data scientist, everything focused on data and development, we normally used isolated or services or processes. What kind of services or processes? For example, if we are building a recommendation system, we may use Snowflake where our database is, or we may use an S3 bucket where we can upload something. We may have another services, another models. So that allows us to generate those recommendations. And those are very little Lego pieces. And each of those pieces is making something in particular. Each of those pieces is focused in accomplishing a task. So those are very little isolated tasks that may be joined in perhaps not the most proper way, not the one that we can escalate, not the one that we can maintain, but we can join them together or we can run it manually. And it is here where Airflow shines. Airflow is that joint between all those isolated services and we can keep them in one place. So each of those Lego pieces, we can join them together and Airflow says, well, what about joining the piece of query and the piece of pandas and the piece of your model? And there you can go until you upload it somewhere. Airflow handles everything. Airflow is like a glue that allows us to integrate all those services that are usually isolated. And it has a few key elements that allow us to do that. It can empower our ideas and automate our ideas, which is the main objective. Airflow is focused or based on DAGs, which are directed acyclic graphs. And that allows us to have a collection of all the tasks that we wanted to run. For example, all that series of ideas. And all those relationships can have dependencies, they can communicate between all the tasks. So we can run a process in the tasks and that result is communicated to another task. And this is why I like to see it as Lego pieces because each of these interacts in a different way. DAGs have operators and operators are connected. And how could we see this? How can we create these graphs? So this is a very simplified way to see a DAG. We have task one, it runs a query. Then we have a task two, which may be a Python script that read from pandas, that uses NumPy, that creates data frames. Maybe you just join a module to clean up information, to select the best attributes. So then in task three, you can obtain a correlation matrix. So it depends a lot on the idea that you want to automate. And when we can run all these processes, maybe in task two, task three, or task four, this result can be shared with task five, which may be our model, the model that we can call a microservice or that can be integrated on Airflow itself, an image that we may be executing. And task six may be the generation of a recommendation system. So if we thought about this in an isolated way, I consider that it would be very complicated to join all these pieces, these acyclical continuous pieces of each of the tasks. Something here that you must avoid, which is invalid in Airflow, is to have cycles. So we cannot have cycles. This is why it's a DAG. This is why it's an acyclical directed graph. So for that, Airflows gives us a lot of key elements to help us work. Something that I love is the dashboard, the UI. 
because in a visual way, we can see all the DAGs that we have. Each of the data pipelines which are available to us, and we can see if any of these failed, in what stage did they fail, if they already finished running, what day of the week are they running, in what day did they fail, and you can see each of them to see what's right, what's wrong, what are the results. We also have our scheduler and our executor. Something that's fascinating about Airflow, <clears throat> and I return to the idea of John to get up every day and run this task, Airflow makes this easier. We can configure these data pipelines and say, you know what, I want this to be executed every day at this time. I want this to be executed every week or one day and every other day. We can decide when to execute this depending on the business needs and the executor is what handles that. Once the executor knows what's planned, then it starts executing the tasks and starts running all the data pipeline. And we finally have the workers which are fundamental for this and they need to see if everything is working correctly. And then there are two elements which are key and I consider that they give it this push to Airflow, which are the operators and the sensors. So what, what are they? Operators, well, as I, as I was saying, we have those little Lego blocks. So each of these blocks, we can see it as a task. And within that task, we have our operators in a very easy to see way or perhaps a simplified way to see it, some Python classes which are executing one or many functions. So within this operator, we have Python code which executes whatever we want. And this is a great advantage and this is what allowed me to use Airflow. I used to have separate scripts and when I saw that those scripts can could become operators, I saw that I could reuse what I already have. I didn't have to develop everything again. I just had to adapt it to the structure, to the architecture that Airflow needed. As Airflow needed to create an operator. So that's basically what it is, or Python code, which is embedded in the structure that Airflow asks us. And we have a series of operators that make our life easier. We have, for example, bash, which we can run commands. And then there is the Slack operator, which is amazing because I will tell you a success case that we've been working on. When we run a model and we wanted to know whether the recommendations were ready or not, we sent a, a message to Slack that said, recommendations are ready, you can turn them on. And in that way, you don't have to constantly be checking if the file was created. That's what the Slack operator does. And it lets you know whether it had been calculated. You can also send emails with the format that you want to the people that you want in a very automated way. It's very simple. You can communicate with different databases. You can also embed Python code. You can create your own operator. You can develop your own operator and you can share it with the community for, so that someone else doesn't have to do their own. And that's the idea of having open source code. This is perhaps a very small example. And this is the overall structure of an operator. As you can see, it's Python code. And I can define a series of instructions, a series of, va of global variables and then later I can communicate between them. And all that Python code is what I reused with the structure that Airflow needed. So how does that look? This is how you are going to start seeing it, of course, depending on what each of you do, but these are the operators, the little tasks that you're going to have in the UA. And if something fails, well, 
you can see it in red. This is a way of visualizing things. This is the way that I like the most because it allows me to see what's the communication between these pieces. And on the other way, we have sensors. And sensors have a very specific function that helps us a lot to solve tasks. The goal of the sensors is wait for some condition, to wait for something to work, for something to finish, so that the next stages can continue. What kind of sensors do we have? We have a lot. These are the ones that I use more regularly. The time sensor, which specifies a specific time of the day to run a task. For example, I can begin to run a model if I don't have the data first. If I don't have the data someplace, well, I can't continue because there's nothing to do. I also have uh, sensors to know if there is a new file or folder in a file system. Sensors for the S3 bucket to see if somebody has uploaded a file to a particular bucket or to a particular section and to continue working with that. And also uh, HTTP sensor, if we use microservices, we can make use of those microservices and what kind of uh, answer we get, what kind of response we get. If we have a 200, if you have an okay, well, we can continue. So we can have uh, an indefinite number of tries Normally, I configure three tries maximum, and you can configure that in, in the parameters. So what's the action plan? I told you a little bit about John, and we are going to go back to him. I hope you remember John. John was having a really bad time because he had to wake up at 6 a.m. He had to do everything manually. And here is where Airflow arrives to the rescue. He says, look, there is a way that you can solve this. There is a way in which you will not be doing this manually, but you will be able to identify what are the tasks that are repeated. What are the tasks that you need to do the most? What are the parameters that you need to start modifying? What kind of Python code you already have developed and you can integrate it? So Airflow comes to the rescue and now John achieved something like this. It's a series of tasks. I know the image is a little bit small, but this is a series of tasks. And the first thing you do is a task to listen to the finance team. I was telling you that precisely there is a sensor that is constantly listening or the time that we choose. So it's constantly listening for a file or an S3 bucket. So the sensor is trying to see if it has a new file. And if the file comes, the next thing you have to do is to run a query. He used to do this manually. So what was the different thing that he had to do every day? Change the create at. Tell the script what are the data that it needed to work with. So you need to uh, configure the parameter and this is something easily configurable. You can choose the date on Python and you can run the new query and you obtain this data. What's the next thing that you're going to do? This data, you can save it again in some temporary folder or you can even upload it to another folder in S3 just uh, to have an archive of data. And there is a new sensor to see if there's a new file on that S3 folder. And the next thing you have to do is to compute the data. How? With the script that John already had. You just have to adapt it to the, to the structure of the operator. And once the data has been computed and the test cases have been run, you need to upload this data to a new section that he already had in a path that had already been defined with whatever structure that you want. So the file is uploaded to the folder and we use our email operator. And if we want to go beyond this, we can use the Slack operator. So we have a dedicated channel to send an, a Slack notification or an email to the team or the group 
which is interested in receiving this data and the flow ends. So here is where Airflow is not only an orchestrator, not, it's not only a tool, but it helps somebody to rest better and it helps the team to escalate, to generate new ideas, to automate what currently in many companies, for example, if you have a similar use case, Airflow can be an excellent option. So instead of executing a lot of cron jobs, you can generate a pipeline. And you may wonder, well, what's the difference between a cron job and Airflow? So there are different uh, matters here, and I will show it to you. Here is how you can have another visualization. And as you can see, there are some small red squares. That means that some of the tasks did not finish. Why, how a task failed in a cron job is very obscure. You may have logs, but you don't know that for certain. But here you can access the tasks and you can see what are the parameters, what worked, what didn't. You can include alert systems. There are very good services that do this and each of these alerts can have different levels. The lowest level or the critical level and each of these alerts can be configured depending on the business. If it's a critical case, perhaps you need to call somebody. So there is a service that allows you to do this. And the advantages to use Airflow besides automating and having the support of the community, which is the most important thing to me, to be able to see how the community can continue supporting Airflow and how everyone is helping each other. You can automate your queries. You can use your Python code. If you have a Jupyter notebook, you can use that, you can use paper mail to be used to use that Jupyter code. So you don't have to do everything all over. You just need to know what tools that Airflow has you can integrate. It also has that retry policy and you can configure in your DAG how many retries you want to configure. How many times are you going to allow Airflow to retry after a failure? and at what time it's going to send you an alert. This is a great advantage when you have a lot of, pipeline, of pipelines because it'll be very complex to know which of those worked, which of those didn't send updated data, and it will depend on the business. The importance of the data will depend on the business. So perhaps the data does not need to be updated daily. So you can leave previous data and recommend that but there are other critical cases in for example healthcare or financial companies where you need to see what and why it failed and you can also monitor what is happening for example as i showed you previously you have a very easy interface it's very easy to see what is failing what the pay which pay pipeline has been constructed and to have each of the logs and understand the logs as well as your alert system, which is amazing to integrate with Ops Genie. And some recommendations that I've had to be able to start to automate my ideas with Airflow is first, and this changed completely my vision about Airflow, is to join the Slack community. Everyone is very active in the community. They're always trying to lend a hand. You can see the errors in some other people and you can compare it with what you have. You can find good practices. If you have a question, you can post it. And I assure you that someone is going to try to help you or at least send you a link that can help you. So I recommend registering to Airflow Summit and perhaps you will get more information about that later and what's shared in the summit is beyond what why airflow works they share with you success cases where it's currently being used how you can use kubernetes how can you use it in a larger business how can you integrate models how can you turn this productive and how astronomer can help you use airflow so this is these are very interesting points and you will 
If you want to continue to learn about Airflow, you are going to find it on the summit. Also, check the documentation. It's perfectly designed so you can see not only what each of these key elements are, but how can you implement it. It's very simple to learn by examples, and they do that. And I recommend a lot that you can reuse operators and sensors. And also, please avoid to, to reinvent everything. Just reuse what you have. And of course, I recommend activating your alerts and logs to know which of your pipelines is working and which don't. And that is all. Thank you very much for your time.